Fantastic. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Beth Levin, and I'm Associate Professor at Georgetown University School of Medicine. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. Um, just to let you know uh, who I am or what I do, I'm just going to give you a quick outline. I tend to speak very quickly. If you need me to slow down, just let me know. Go on to the next slide. All right, so the plan for tonight is we're going to talk about the opioid epidemic, then we're going to go to naloxone, which is also known as Narcan, then break it down to specifically what you can do. Then we'll dive into syringe exchange programs and why they're so key in the response to the opioid epidemic. Talk a little bit about harm reduction 101 since it's a little different from our approaches as clinicians. Talk a little bit about the mis and mis misunderstandings about syringe exchange and then focus mostly on ways that students can make a difference and where we go from here. So in terms of how bad is this issue, well, drug overdose deaths have tripled uh, since, uh, since 1990, and they're getting even higher. How bad is it? It's so bad that in 2009, we actually had more deaths due to drug overdose than to traffic accidents. And I want to point out the year 2009 because that's a really key year that's going to have a profound impact because what happened in 2009 is that people said, holy cow, we really got a problem here, and their response was to cut down on the pill mills, and the pill mills are basically providers who overprescribe medications, sometimes for ethical, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes uh, for very intentional, non-ethical reasons, and so by cutting down on the pill mills, we thought we had had some unintended repercussions, but just to take a step back, we're seeing that overdose deaths from prescription drugs in general very much increased from 2001 to 2014. These are prescription drugs overall, but the majority of these prescription drug deaths are actually due to opiate pain relievers. And what happened in 2009 is we actually saw a transition of drug overdose deaths, not just from prescription pain medications, but also to heroin. So what happened is in 2009, people said, holy cow, there really is an issue. We need to cut down on this. We need to make these opiate medications, prescriptions, much less available. And let me ask you something. If I have substance use disorder, if I have a dependency and I'm not no longer able to access prescription medications, does that mean that my substance use disorder is going to go away? Does that mean that my cravings or my dependencies are going to go away? No. It's what's going to happen is I'm still going to have that need. And so what happened is we created a generation of basically pharma refugees. and. Through this policy, we basically turned a generation of people with substance use disorder using prescription medications to a generation of folks who started using heroin instead. In fact, 70% of people who use heroin at this point in time got their start with prescription, with, got their start with prescription medications. And this is really problematic because with prescription medications, at least we have some quality assurance. We know what's in there and we know how much is in there. But with heroin, you don't necessarily know what you're getting or how pure it is or if there's anything else in there such as fentanyl. So this is a huge issue that had incredible ramifications. How bad was it? We had an incredible surge in 2015. And then if you look, we have this, again, the huge jump from heroin meeting uh, and actually surpassing drug overdose deaths attributable to prescription drugs. And then how bad was it? We actually had more drug deaths to gun homicide, more drug deaths, excuse me, to heroin use than we did from guns. That's how bad it is. And that's just looking at heroin use. So if you, com if you combine the number of deaths attributable to overdose from heroin to those attributable to prescription drug use, we actually almost have twice as many deaths to opiates than we do to gun or homicides. That's how bad we've gotten it. And so just to give you another way of looking at the information, we've got 1,000 people a day who are coming into emergency departments for not using prescription opioids as directed. Not the best wording, and I'll talk in a minute about why that's not the best wording, but this is the CDC's wording. But how, what does that actually translate into? It translates into 91 Americans dying every day from an opiate overdose. If you include opiate drug overdoses in general, that's a 9-11 tragedy every three days. That's how bad it is here in the U.S. And where are we seeing these rising drug deaths? Right here. So whom are we talking about? So 
there are certain stereotypes about who is most likely to overdose. And actually what's interesting is that the person who is most likely to overdose is male. And typically in his 40s and 50s. And up until 2015, it was basically a white guy in his 40s and 50s. Uh, from prescription pain medicine, as of 2015, it's pretty much a white guy, 40s or 50s, dying from heroin. That's not to say that other age groups are not affected. They're very much affected. But the stereotype that it's someone in their teens or 20s, um, that's, not, that's definitely a population that's affected, but that's not the population that is most affected. And a population that we tend to th forget about are folks who are seniors they also are very much impacted by this issue as well. So one of the things that was done, I'm just gonna, is there was a study of 33 countries and looked at drug overdose deaths, which were the best countries, which were the worst countries. And the worst countries in terms of the greatest risk, greatest increase of deaths was here in the United States. And what they found is that the biggest reason why programs that were successful was having access to drug treatment, not just any kind of drug treatment, but specifically medication-assisted treatment in the form of opiate substitution therapy. So there, it goes by different names, such as methadone, methadone is one approach, buprenorphine, suboxone is another approach. These were the countries that were actually the most successful. This is increasing in drug deaths. These are decreases in drug deaths. And the big factor for all of these was actually access to medication-assisted treatment, particularly the form of opiate substitution therapy. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read the very, very, very fine print, but in terms of the demand and versus the need, you can see to the state by state the extent to which we are not able to meet that demand. And one of the issues is that for buprenorphine, which is also known as Suboxone, there are certain laws uh, for that. One of the laws is that you have to have a waiver. So basically you take a test, you take a class, you take a test, you pass, that's fine. And I absolutely support that policy. But one of the difficulties is, is that once you get that waiver, you can only have up to 30 patients your first year and then up to 100 patients afterwards at maximum. And so even though there's no limit to the number of patients to whom you can prescribe oxycodone or Percocet or Vicodin, there's actually, in terms of treatment of substance use disorder, we actually have a limit in terms of number of patients that you can have. And so what we have are these treatment deserts. So to give you an example, I was working with a syringe exchange program in Tacoma, Washington. A patient was ready to get into drug treatment, wanted to try buprenorphine, and we went on the national database and we actually found only three prescribers in a 300-mile radius that this patient could access. But actually, the patient couldn't even access them because two of the providers had already maxed out. They already reached their 100 patients. And the third one is working through the VA. And so what happens is that there isn't a lack of demand for these services. It's basically people want these services, but they're not available. And so what we see instead is a black market for access to buprenorphine or Suboxone. Now, it's important to be clear that when I say black market, people are not taking these drugs to get high because heroin is much less expensive and much more effective. Buprenorphine is actually a partial opioid agonist, so it's very hard to get high. And if you do get high, it's not very high, so you're much better off if you want to get high to use heroin. So when people are using these black markets to get these medications, it's not to get high. It's they're actually self-medicating for substance use disorder. So what we actually have here in the United States is a Dallas Buyers Club environment for the treatment of substance use disorder here in the United States. So why is the Affordable Care Act important? Because what covers three out of 10 people with infection, excuse me, with opioid, who use opioids? Medicaid. One out of three. This is why we need to support the Affordable Care, the Affordable Care Act. And uh, people will talk about um, when we talk about naloxone. Naloxone is a medication to, we give to people to revive them once they've had an overdose. And it's like, well, why should we do that? Well, the reason why it's important to do that is because it's hard to get people into treatment if they're dead. And so here's a really good quote from my friend Billy Tyler. Um, She's talking about how lack of 
access to naloxone is basically the difference between life and death. But I have to say it's not just the government, it's also physicians in terms of how available they are trying to make this drug. So let's talk about what we can do as providers to save lives here. So what is naloxone? Naloxone is an opioid agonist. It is very safe. The most important thing to understand about it is that the only side effect is that it can cause withdrawal for someone who's already using opiates. If you're opiate naive, so personal, uh, my own personal experience is that the most exciting drug I've ever done is an Irish coffee. If you were to administer naloxone to me right here, right now, you know what would happen? Absolutely nothing, zero, zip, zilch, nothing would happen. There are absolutely no side effects. The only potential side effect is if someone, adverse effect is if someone is allergic and there are no recorded cases of anyone ever being allergic. This is a drug that's been around since 1990, excuse me, 1971, so we have quite a history of it. It's an extremely safe drug. So remember how I talked about how the CDC was using words like did not use opiates effectively or did not take as directed and this could be a problem? Well, that's actually not the best wording because even if you take it as directed, you can still have an adverse event. And there are a number of reasons why you can have an adverse event. One is that the reason why these opiates kill you is they cause respiratory depression. And so if you have any problems with your, with your lungs, such as COPD or pneumonia or asthma, that can be exacerbated by using opiates. Even if you take it directed, that respiratory depression can, can cause by the opiate can cause you to die. Also, if you have problems with your liver, with your kidneys, these are organs that process your medication. So if you have problems with your liver or kidneys to begin with, taking an opiate can be complicated by that, even if you take it as directed, because it's not going to be as processed as quickly as a healthy person. So those are some things to be aware of. Also, polypharmacy. You may be taking that medication as directed, but you might also be co-prescribed another medication which can have an adverse effect. So it can have a negative effect. So for example, benzodiazepines in combination with opiates are an extremely deadly combination. Also, anti-anxiety medications can also exacerbate the effects of opiates. Even counterintuitive things like cocaine, which you think would be an upper, can actually exacerbate the effects of prescription opiates. The other thing is that these medications come as a lot of different names. They have brand names. They have generic names. They can be in combination with other medications. So, for example, a lot of patients don't realize that Tylenol-3 is an opiate because it said the first name of it is Tylenol. And so a patient may be taking multiple medications that include opiates and don't realizing that they're doubling up on opiates. Uh, not intentionally, they're taking the medications as prescribed, but they can still have an adverse effect. Some people are just more genetically more susceptible. Also drinking alcohol, it, it also deadens um, your awareness and it's, it's, a, it's a respiratory depressant of, it, of itself, user error. Did I remember to take my medication? I can't remember. Let me take my medication just in case. Also, a period of abstinence. We tend to see that there's a much greater risk of having a, an overdose if, after a period of abstinence, if you've been in treatment for a while, if you were incarcerated for a while. Uh, also, if you just haven't taken it for a while, let's say you were taking some medication for your knee, that was six months ago, you recently hurt your hip, and you remembered, okay, when I hurt my knee, it really hurt, so I took six pills, this is hurting much more, let me take nine, and you don't realize that the tolerance you developed six months ago was now gone during this period of abstinence, and this is when you tend to overdose. Also, switching medications. And the other thing is that people, even if you take it as prescribed, we know that people will borrow their friends and family members' medications. So they'll take medications that were not prescribed to them. So those are the reasons why it's not just about use as directed. It's uh, an adverse reaction can occur even if you do everything right according to your doctor's orders. So how do you talk to your patients about opioid safety? Um, Basically, we can say, you know, some people have side effects. You can have an adverse reaction. These are the symptoms to look for. And here's some sample language. And so the question is, when do you write a script? Um, it's important to know that naloxone is covered by most private medication, private insurance programs. It's covered by Medicaid programs in 49 states. So insurance covers it. It's a matter of just getting it out there as often as we can and as much as we can. When the head of the AMA says we need to make this medication as available as tap water, 
that says something, because if you're familiar with the AMA, they are not a super liberal organization. They're actually pretty conservative. So they're saying we need to make this medication as available, as accessible as top water. That, that really says something. So any time a patient is prescribed an opioid medication, I could then Percocet say, hey, by the way, I'm going to co-prescribe this with you. So in case you have an adverse reaction, this is available for you. If the patient's using opioids of any kind, so if they tend to be forthcoming, say, yeah, I do use heroin on occasion, go ahead and co-prescribe it. After a period of abstinence of any kind, we've already talked about that. Also, if the patient has experienced, um, has ever personally experienced an adverse reaction, that's someone we know already has a proclivity or a vulnerability to overdosing. So if they have a history of it, even if they're not currently taking opiates, go ahead and make that drug available. If also, if the person's ever witnessed an overdose or an adverse reaction, that's important too because this is someone who's clearly in an environment where there are vulnerabilities. So because they're in an envir environment where there are vulnerabilities, they're also keyly play key and very strategically placed to actually do something instructive about it. Also, if the patient asks for it, they may not want to be totally forthcoming about why their concerns are, but if they ask for it, there's a reason. Go ahead and prescribe it. And the other thing is that if a patient or household, if a patient has a, ha a family member who might benefit from it. So for example, um, I might come to my doctor and I might say, uh, I'm really worried about my nephew. Can I please? and gets some naloxone. And this is called third-party prescribing. Now, this differs from typical medical practice. In typical medical practice, if I were to say to you, hey, doc, my nephew has the sniffles. Can you please prescribe me antibiotic? Uh, the doctor's response would be, no, that's not right. We don't do that. But this is different. This is one, of the, the one exception, whereas if you want to get it for a family member, it's okay. To what extent is that okay? Actually, 48 states have specifically passed laws to encourage physicians to do this kind of third-party prescribing. That's the extent to which folks want to get this medication out there in the hands of people. Where are people getting medications? Mostly from friends or relatives. And I think this is a really key lesson that we can have kiosks for people to safely dispose of their use medications. We can talk to people about safely disposing of their used medications, the ones that are left over that they, they're not using. We, we advise them to wrap it up in kitty litter, something unappealing so the person's less likely to go through the trash and pull it out. But the fact of the matter is that advice is helpful, but unfortunately people still hoard their medications and because people still hoard their medications, friends and family members still access it. In terms of what an overdose looks like, here are some symptoms. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about what are the larger community implications for naloxone. It's been around since 1971. It's been available in, in generic form since 1996. One of the concerns is if we start making this available, we'll start will people become very blasé about the, the risk of drug use? Will they be more risk-taking when it comes to using drugs? It's called risk compensation. And the answer is no. It's, it's been studied pretty extensively. And the reason why there isn't risk compensation is if you take it, you will go into withdrawal. And withdrawal is not a very fun experience. Because of that, we don't see any risk compensation. How do we know? Well, we've been offering this for a long time. There's no potential for abuse because you can't get high from it. Again, if you give it to someone who's never taken it, what will the side effects be? Um, if someone's never taking any opiate, there's not going to be any, any impact at all. If they, do take, if they do have OPs in the system, there will be withdrawal. People, absolutely, um, people actually use it, and we'll talk about that in a sec. And then one key thing is that actually leads to treatment for substance use disorder. For a lot of folks, experiencing an overdose is a real wake-up call. Also, the fact that they have a relationship with some kind of service provider from whom they got Narcan, that actually opens doors to talk about what's going on and talking about what sort of services they may or may not need. And those services may actually, that relationship may lead to a referral to drug treatment. So what we find is that it actually serves as a bridge to drug treatment. So rather than encouraging drug use, it actually serves as a way for people to reduce or get out of drug use altogether. And then one thing that's very interesting is we see a lot of people sort of compare this to the EpiPen. It's like something you have just in case you need it. And what's interesting is that if you have an EpiPen, maybe a fraction of EpiPens are ever used, and so the return on investment is rather low. What we see here is something a little different with, with Narcan. What we see is that the number of lives saved with Narcan is actually greater, about 50% greater than the number of prescriptions given. 
So this is phenomenal. So your return on investment isn't like 2 to 5% like what you would see with an EpiPen. It's actually like 150%. And the reason why is that by making naloxone available, you are actually breaking down these barriers of silence, talking about why people are overdosing, how people are overdosing, how to avoid an, uh, an overdose. And so the number of lives you're saying is actually much mm -hmm. higher than the number of prescriptions that you write. And how many times can you say that about a medication? Hardly ever. So can we make a difference? Yes, you said quite it. We can totally make a difference. In fact, 150,000 lay people have been trained. This resulted in 26,000 overdoses. And this is the key thing, and this is why syringe exchange programs are so very important. 80% of these reversals were performed by drug users. So when we're talking about something that's by the community and for the community, there's no clearer example than syringe exchange and naloxone distribution programs. In fact, in North Carolina, they have a four-year program exclusively through their syringe exchanges and it's resulted in 7,750 reversals, all done by current injection drug users. Um, the FDA would love to make this available over the counter. In fact, when something is, in order to apply for something to be available over the counter, you have to provide educational materials that make sense and that are accurate. And actually the FDA is, not only, they're so enthusiastic about it, what they've done is they've developed those educational materials. They are so anxious, they would love for it to be available over the counter. They've developed their educational materials. They're just saying to the companies, go ahead and put your label on it, and we're good to go. Unfortunately, the private companies, because it's very profitable, are not as incentivized, but just to give you some sort of sense of the extent to which we want to get this out there as much as possible, the FDA is doing what they've never done before in order to make this available. But another thing that the FDA has also done is also acknowledge the relationship with overdose and polypharmacy, particularly with benzodiazepines, to the extent that any, for any product that contains benzos, they have to issue a black box warning, which means that 289 different products have to change their packaging. That's something that's going to cost millions and millions of dollars, but they feel that it's necessary in order to avoid any more overdose deaths. So, if you're worried that you might get in trouble for prescribing naloxone, you've got laws and stats to back you up. As I mentioned, 48 states have explicitly stated it's okay to do third-party prescription. And in fact, the study was done and no physician has ever been sued for doing a third-party prescription. And again, this is a medication that's been around since 1971. 37 states have good Samaritan laws that protect people from prosecution if you were to call 911. And 40 states have standing orders. I'll talk about what that is in just a sec. And again, who is doing these reversals? Who is saving all of these lives? 83% are drug users, 9.6% are friends and family, and 0.2% are service providers. So yes, people who, you know, paramedics do provide naloxone, but when it comes to saving lives, they're not doing the heavy lifting. And so what that means is that we as providers, we need to do some of the more uh, the heavy lifting to get this medication out and available to folks who don't necessarily access syringe exchange programs. So how do you get this medication out? There are three different ways. One is that you simply write a prescription for your patient. Your patient takes it to the pharmacy and they're good to go. The other model is you write a prescription and you give the medication right then and there. So it saves them a trip to the pharmacy. The third way is what we call a standing order. So 40 states have a variation of a standing order. We experience this all the time when you go to CVS and you get a flu shot. That's a standing order. It's not that there wasn't a prescription written. The prescription was written. It's on hold. It's available at the pharmacy. And uh, this is something we see in the for naloxone in different states. So in my home state of California, Ralph's Supermarket has a standing order for naloxone. So you get your groceries, you get your naloxone, you're good to go. That's the general trend we want to go to, but again, not every state has that. And so that's why we as providers need to make this as available as possible by prescribing it every possible chance we get. So the President's Commission uh, recently released an interim report on how to address the opioid process, crisis. This is what they recommended. So they recommended the standing order that I just described. They also recommended co-prescriptions. So anytime you have an opioid, you go ahead and prescribe naloxone as well. They also uh, suggested increasing access to law enforcement. Uh, and that's because for a lot of first responders, the first responder is not necessarily going to be a paramedic. It may be a police officer. And 
typically for other first responders, such as firefighters and paramedics, are not going to enter a scene until police have secured the area first. And that's why they made that recommendation for law enforcement to have it as well. They also suggested declaring a state of emergency so that they can better negotiate prices for government agencies like law enforcement. And then this is what's really nice, is that they advocated that if you're going to be federal qualified health center, you need, all of your providers need to, be ha need to have those waivers for buprenorphine. Basically, all providers need to be trained in buprenorphine. Uh, right now, it, it's sort of a binary. You sort of ask, does your center offer buprenorphine? And the person says yes or no, but it doesn't tell you how many of your providers offer, offer buprenorphine, or is there a waiting list uh, to, to access that one or two, those one or two providers are actually trained. But this is actually requiring all of your providers. And that makes sense, because I, the stereotype is that you have to be a psychiatrist to provide buprenorphine. But the reality is most of the folks that I know who provide buprenorphine are family practice physicians. And remember how I talked about uh, wanting to make it uh, over the counter? This is the reason why there's probably, it's probably not going to become available over the counter anytime soon, just because it's become so very profitable, which is, again, all the more reason why we need to make it available uh, through prescriptions as much as we possibly can. So to script or not to script, you should, uh, I'm going to, of course, advocate that you should write a prescription because you, there may or may not be a standing order in your state. Uh, the standing order may be for a certain pharmacy. So, for example, CBS has standing orders in 14 states, uh, but maybe not in your state. And the pharmacist may not be aware of the standing order. The patient may not know to ask for it in a law what. What is that called again? They may not remember the name. Uh, the patient may not remember to ask for it because they've got pri uh, competing priorities. Also, just logistically, it's much easier to pick up all of your prescriptions at once, and you have to worry about billing or payment issues if the prescription is written by the provider in advance. And ultimately, there is no downside to writing a prescription. And in terms of resources, these are your new best friends. And so where do we go from here? Lead by example. Get some for yourself. So just as I always keep condoms with me, I always have naloxone too. It's important to lead by example. You can always pull it out when you're talking to your friends and say, listen, I was into this webinar with this woman who spoke really fast, and here's this visual aid, and this is what she told me, and here you can see for yourself and learn all about yourself. The other thing is get out the word out by social media. When I talk to folks about this, they're like, wow, I had no idea. I didn't hear about this. Well, one very simple way to get the word out is just to post something on Facebook. Do you think people might be interested? Of course they're going to be interested. You've posted about your breakfast. You've posted about the new pedicure you had. You can post about naloxone. Um, you can also train your classmates. So this is a very easy brown bag lunch. This is sort of a just add water kind of presentation. What I will do with folks, uh, what I'll do uh, with the AAN folks afterwards is you'll get a copy of this PowerPoint. I'll also include a couple of links to videos. This is a nice thing. You order pizza, you show the videos, and everyone gets trained in naloxone. It's a very easy way to make this a national AMSA product, project. And uh, it says a it should, be afford it should be support the Affordable Care Act uh, for the reasons that I said, that most people who have an, you know, one out of three people who use opiates are covered by Medicaid. And Medicaid, for the most part, does cover both buprenorphine and naloxone. And the third thing is to support your local syringe exchange. Why should you support your local syringe exchange? Two reasons. One is that they get naloxone out there better than anybody else. And the other reason is that they serve as a bridge to drug, to drug treatment better than anybody else. So I'm going to go ahead and transition to syringe exchange programs. So why should anyone care? Well, you should care for all the reasons here that I'm not going to read because you can read yourself. But yeah, health care is a right. And what is harm reduction? So harm reduction is it's, uh, people talk about meeting people where they're at rather than where you would like them to be. This approach differs from the one that we typically take uh, in, in, uh, in the medical world. In our world, what we're told is our job is to define the problem. If there's more than one problem, figure out which problem is most important problem. So we triage the issue, and then we tell the patient, this is what you should, these are the problems, these are the problems you have to address first, 
and this is how you should address them. Well, harm reduction is actually the opposite of that. It, what it does is it actually, instead of having a provider-driven agenda, you actually have a patient-driven agenda. So the patient may come in and say, I am really concerned about my wounds, my injection-related wounds. You might want to test them for HIV, you might want to test them for hepatitis C, you might want to refer them to drug treatment. They're not interested in that. They want to get treatment for their wounds, and you know, because they're the ones driving the treatment, that's what we're going to address first. And so the ultimate goal of harm reduction is actually not abstinence, it's actually self-determination. And so sometimes when I've worked with medical students and they come on the van, they'll get very frustrated. They're like, well, we should recommend any treatment. We should recommend, you know, recommend any treatment every single time. And uh, the important thing to remember is that patients already know that treatment is available. And if you keep reminding them that treatment's available, they already know that. And what's going to happen is if you become a nag, they're going to tune out and turn off and stop coming. And if they stop coming, how effective are your services going to be if no one is there to receive them? So it's a difference between what should make sense and what actually works. And this is what actually works. And if you looked back at the slide where there was an increase in overdose deaths, there was an increase you saw not just in the U.S. but also in the U.K., and which is surprising because the U.K. historically has been very good in harm reduction. And they said, well, what's going on? Why is this their increase? And they realized the increase happened when they transitioned away from harm reduction and more toward a punitive get people to treatment, get people to treatment model rather than letting people decide for themselves what services they needed most. So it's, do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? And if you want to be effective, you got to use harm reduction approach. Um, I included this uh, photo of a needle here just so people can understand that it's syringe exchange isn't just about preventing blood-borne disease but also injuries relating to injection drug use. So you can see that when a person is forced to reuse a needle, the needle's going to become uh, bent and damaged, and it's going to require increased force in order to penetrate that vein, and you can have a number of injuries caused by that. So, for example, I had a patient where the needle actually broke off inside her vein while she was using it. So there are a number of reasons why we want to offer clean syringes. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that places in this fourth bullet right here is that places individuals in a greater social context. And one of the things that we notice is that person may have ancillary issues that they need to address first. And one of the things that I've noticed is uh, people may have other mental health issues. So I have patients who use cocaine to balance out their bipolar disorder or they use heroin to get the voices in their head to mellow out. Here in D.C. we did a study of women who inject and what we found is that two-thirds of those women had a history of sexual trauma. When those, report, those stats reported to the health department, they were surprised it was that high. For those of us who were in the field, we, we were surprised it wasn't much higher. Um, nationally, it's about 40 percent of people with substance use disorder have uh, another mental health issue as well. So what harm reduction is not, it's not whatever happens, happens. It's not anything goes. Uh, it's not a free for all. People, actually, my personal experience is that the clients are very orderly, very polite. Uh, I sort of joke with with folks like, who is like most polite? Is it people that I work with at the World Bank? Is it medical students? Or is it my clients at the syringe exchange? And I'll give you a hint: it's not the first two. The, the folks that I find are the most receptive and the most polite are actually the syringe exchange clients. So. Is harm reduction a special thing just for drug use? No, we actually practice harm reduction all the time, whether it's condom use or wearing seat belt or wearing a helmet or nutrition. I think that's where we see the most harm reduction. We don't say never, ever, ever eat uh, cookies or candy. We say try to make half your grains whole, try to eat whole fruits instead of frozen, uh, whole fruits better than, than juice. Uh, you know, we have, looking at Sesame Street, we talk about having sometimes foods versus always foods. And so harm reduction is actually not this radical new approach. It's just something we haven't necessarily thought of in the context, context of substance use. And then when we talk about harm reduction, it's more uh, than, than preventing HIV and viral hepatitis. It's offering all these various services that you see here. And people often ask, do syringe exchange programs prevent hepatitis C? The answer is yes, but you do have a very limited window of opportunity just because one-third of people who, uh, who inject become infected within the first year just because hepatitis C is so much more easily transmitted and one half within five. So can syringe exchange pre prevent hepatitis C? Absolutely, but you really have to hustle. 
And when we talk about syringe exchange programs, I think it's important to understand, appreciate people in the context of their community. So it's not just protecting the injection drug user, it's also about protecting their spouses, their partners, and their kids. And here in the U.S., where you tend to see a lot of pediatric HIV is where you also tend to see a lot of HIV driven by injection drug use. And one thing I do want to touch base on is, is this a health disparity issue? This is absolutely a health disparity issue. When African Americans are 11 times Latinos are five times, and Native Americans are twice as likely to acquire HIV through injection drug use than their Caucasian counterparts, yeah, it's absolutely a health disparity issue. But what we also see is, interestingly enough, uh, is that, for example, in New Mexico, not only are Latinos and Native Americans disproportionately affected, but they're actually more likely to access the services once they're made available. And nationally, that's been the case for African Americans as well. So the stereotype that people who use drugs are unengaged or uninterested in accessing health services and taking care of your health, that's actually not the case. If you're looking for some stats, there are some stats there. So do syringe exchange programs work? Yes, they do, in all these various different ways that I'm going to talk about momentarily. But I do want to highlight that recently the CDC has been celebrating the fact that we've had a decline in new infections by 18 percent. But the greatest decline has been here among people who inject drugs. So again, the stereotype that people who inject are not interested in their health, that they're irresponsible or unmotivated, completely untrue. Here's the stat that proves it. And what we find is that when you have the syringe exchange program, HIV incidence tends to decrease by um, up to 80-something uh, percent, uh, anywhere from 70 to 90-something percent, depending on how long the syringe exchange program has been around. And so do people like syringe exchange programs? Yeah, all these people listed here like syringe exchange programs. And there are already a number of programs here. This, this map is a little dated. There are actually more syringe exchange programs now than featured here, but they exist in about 35 different states. And uh, the, the idea that syringe exchange programs are somehow controversial, not true, actually about 82%, depending on the year, anywhere from 81 to 84% of funding for syringe exchange programs actually comes from local and state governments. And so these are communities that understand what the, the needs of the community are, and they're actually using their own dollars to do it. So if that's not local buy-in for a program, I don't know what is. And we've already talked about this. So one of the things that people don't understand about syringe exchange is they think it's a syringe distribution program. We just go around and hand out needles for people. And it's actually, no, it's, a, it's an exchange. You bring in your used syringes and you get fresh needles. And what that does is it actually takes used needles out of the environment, making it safer for everyone. And so here are some examples. And I wanted to highlight the one at the bottom because what they did is these medical students pictured here did a study and what they found is that in Miami where there was no legal syringe exchange, there were eight times as many improperly disposed needles as San Francisco, even though San Francisco has twice as many injection drug users. Why? Because syringe exchange is legal in San Francisco. And who collected that really, really sexy data? These medical students right here. And so because syringe exchange programs get used needles off the streets, uh, they actually enjoy a certain amount of support f from law enforcement programs. And what we found is interesting is that they actually protect those who protect us. So for law enforcement, they will sometimes encounter needle stick injuries when they are patting down, uh, patting someone down or performing a search. And what we found is that when you have a syringe exchange program, those needle stick injuries to law enforcement tend to decrease by about two-thirds. And it's not just law enforcement, it's also firefighters as well. And it's one reason why law enforcement has supported syringe exchange. They also recognize that it serves as a bridge to drug treatment. And here are some examples of that. So do syringe exchange programs work? Yes, in all the various ways I just described. But looking at the bottom two, we talked about what really is an appropriate response or an effective response to the opioid epidemic. One is making naloxone available, and we've already talked about that. The other is serving the bridge to drug, treat to drug treatment. So what happened was 
the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration started funding syringe exchange programs. And if you've ever had a SAMHSA grant, you realize you have to turn in a boatload of data. And what they found is that not only do syringe exchange programs serve as an effective bridge to drug treatment, they were actually 25% more effective than their other grantees. So not only do they get people effectively into drug treatment, but they're better than other folks who also do this kind of work. And in fact, in New Jersey, 20% of the state's service program clients have actually entered drug treatment. So again, the key to reversing the opioid epidemic is firstly naloxone to keep people alive, but also access to drug treatment. And no one, again, no one does it better than syringe service programs. Not only that, it saves money. So for every dollar we spend in syringe exchange, we save, a do we save $7 on average, and that's just HIV. That's not looking at viral hepatitis or secondary infections like endocarditis or injection-related wounds. Just looking at HIV, the costs are phenomenal. And here's some local data. And I wanted to highlight the bottom one because this is something that medical students found. And what they found is that uh, just looking at bacterial infections, so not HIV, hepatitis C, or drug overdose, just looking at bacterial infections associated with injection drug use, how much did it cost this one particular hospital over a one year period? And what they found is the cost was $11.4 million. These are costs that could have been averted if they had a syringe exchange program. And what they did is they actually used that data in combination with the other data I presented before to argue for legalizing syringe exchange in their state. Uh, what about pharmacies? Pharmacies are great, but uh, over-the-counter access to syringes varies by the state. They also don't offer the full range that syringe service programs provide. They don't necessarily offer testing for HIV. They don't actually they don't, don't necessarily accept use syringes for safe disposal. They're also just as there are food deserts, there are also deserts for for pharmacies, and you know pharma pharmacies tend to have discretion about whom to uh, to serve. And what, what we found is that people who are most likely to be declined access to clean syringes tend to be people of color. So, is it about syringe exchange or is it about ph pharmacies? Actually, it's a false choice, and we need both. So, if we build it, they will come. So, this is a map that my students made. Um, about syringe exchange and where they were in the city of Washington, D.C., they were accessing the services. So this is Washington, D.C., so just remember this little yellow, sort of not quite a square, and then here we go. So this was this, okay? And now look how far people are traveling. This is Virginia, this is Maryland. People are traveling to access syringe exchange, because in Maryland, there's only one syringe exchange program. It's in Baltimore. Otherwise, throughout the state, it was not accessible. There aren't any syringe exchange programs at all in Virginia. So you see people driving hundreds and hundreds of miles to access services. So I know in other aspects of public health, it can be a real challenge to get people to access services. But this is like that movie about baseball. If you build it, they will come. And not only they will come, they will drive hundreds of miles to access services. So again, the stereotype that people who inject are unmotivated or irresponsible, uh, aren't diligent about taking care of the health, well, look at the stat here. And who provided this really helpful data? It was medical students who mapped it out by zip code. So this is just a photo of me if you're wanting to know what I look like, working in India. Dirt floor, no gloves. This is in 1996. Buprenorphine was the standard of care. We're in the US are a little bit behind. And we've got some more slides of injection-related wounds and more slides of injection-related wounds. Uh, just to let you know, these last two slides of injection-related wounds were not India, but actually here in Washington, D.C. So I sometimes joke that D.C. stands for developing country because some of our health stats are, and some of our health statuses are on par what we see in developing countries. D.C. I don't think is unique in that. We just have that acronym. So one of the things that we started to do is to actually actively address the issue of wound care. And this is something that the medical students took the initiative on. So firstly, they documented the problem. They provided the baseline data, which was helpful. So if we did an intervention, we could see whether or not it was successful. Um, they helped put together the wound care kits. These are the contents of the wound care kits. And one of the criticisms that we received was, OK, you put all these, all these components of the kits. Isn't this expensive? Isn't this an unnecessary expense? And it was actually a student who came in and actually did a utilization review, interviewing the patients to find out what were they using, how often were they using it. And what, they found, what we found is that they were, were indeed using all the components of the kit. So that was very important in helping us to justify to our funders uh, that all the components were needed. It also provided really good 
qualitative data as well as quantitative. The qualitative data we found is that if we did not provide people with distilled water, they were going to use water wherever they could find it, um, including the Potomac. And if, I'm not sure if you've seen the Potomac, but you don't want to drink that water, let alone inject it. And so because the student did this utilization review, we were able to get continued funding. So that was another way that student involvement really made a difference. And then if you look at a syringe, the syringe is about eight, eight cents a piece. And so, you know, little things that medical students did, like having a bake sale or a bottle of water drive, actually bought quite a few needles and was very much appreciated by the community as well. They also did, when, uh, one of the things I noticed is there are plenty of wound care materials out there, but for our population, about one-fourth is functionally illiterate. So they actually developed this much simpler, much more straightforward one-pager on wound care. And uh, it was a two-part pro two process. The first pro part was they developed a rough draft, they showed it to the staff, got feedback from the staff, then showed it to the patients to make sure it would work for them. The other thing is that we have something called the Hoya Clinic, which is a free clinic. And one of the things they did is they explicitly listed minor wound care in their menu of services. So when I was talking to the patients at the syringe exchange, I could say, listen, there's a free clinic, my students run it, and they specifically want to treat clients of the syringe exchange program. That's why they specifically put this little line here about, about wound care. And being able to say that and being able to explicitly say, yes, they, they want folks from Prevention Works, which is the name of the syringe exchange, to come to the clinic made all the difference. How do we know that? Because we actually interviewed patients afterwards, and what we found is that 90% of our patients who had heard of the Hoya Clinic actually went ahead and went there and received services there, not just for wound care, but flu shots, a whole bunch of, a whole range of primary care issues. And so making this very slight change had a profound impact on the lives of the patients who access the syringe exchange program. And how do we know it had a profound impact? Because of the students who did the follow-up study to make sure. They also did peer advocacy talking to their classmates about their experiences at the syringe exchange program and how a lot of the preconceived notions were completely dismantled once they started doing this work. And so we've got some students who are actively engaging in the bottled water drive, a bottled water just because if you're hydrated, it's easier to access a vein and you're much less likely to have a nail stick in, uh, an injury when injecting if you're well hydrated. Here we've got folks who are mapping medical homes. And so what are the other ways that these students got involved? They had volunteer days, it was part of service learning, uh, they provide HIV testing, they also volunteer putting together wound care kits, safer sex kits, male condom kits, female condom kits. They also did uh, a, knowledge, attitude, a CAP study, knowledge, attitudes and practices studies on drug overdose. Um, they also helped develop materials for transgender patients. And they even planted flowers, which, you know, in terms of PR, having curb appeal makes us much more palatable to our neighbors who are wondering why we're there. They could see that we were trying to contribute to the community and, and really helped with community um, acceptance of who we are and what we did. What does uh, any of that have to do with the opioid epidemic? Well, the needle isn't just about preventing HIV and isn't just about preventing hepatitis C, it's also a tool of engagement. And so whatever you can do to get the, the person to come into the clinic, whether it's having um, whether it's having curb appeal, whether it's having free condoms, whether it's having free needles, once people are in there, and once you make it clear that you're going to give them whatever services they want uh, that are available, they are going to continue to come back and come back and, and access more and more services, including naloxone, including access to drug treatment. What we found is that it's actually not a hard pitch to get folks in drug treatment. What we found is that the waiting lists were so long, and that was a matter of keeping people alive until a spot in treatment opened up. So in terms of examples of students making a difference, so these are the students who collected the data that I mentioned um, on the cost of bacterial infections, injection drug use, as uh, well as uh, how not having a syringe exchange program led to a lot of syringes being improperly discarded in public places. And what they did is they began a whole series of activities to try to make syringe exchange legal in their state of Florida. And it was a multi-year process. They introduced the bill. It didn't pass the first time. They introduced it again. It got a few more supporters. It didn't pass again. They, they, they introduced it a third time, and guess what? It passed. So Florida now has its first legal syringe exchange program, which is now being run by Hansel Tukes, who is now a resident at the University of Miami. Who took the leadership on that? Medical students. They recruited 
local medical associations to support it, but they were the ones who collected the data, they're the ones who wrote the legislation, they're the ones who took the leadership, and now we have it. Another example are the folks in uh, UC Irvine, they started Orange County's first syringe exchange program. And what they find so far, they've been up and running for about two and a half years. They've exchanged over a million syringes, and they've served over 10,000 people at this point. They've distributed thousands of naloxone kits, and they're actually serving as a mentor program for medical students at UC Merced, UC's University of California in Iowa, and University of Washington to start their own syringe exchange programs. Part of it is they actually had to change the local law, so here's an op-ed that was written by one of the medical students that was published in a local paper. And op-eds aren't inclusive for syringe exchange. Here's one that was written by a medical student in support of PEPFAR. And just to talk a little bit more about how students can make a difference for the next five minutes. Real quick, simple thing that you can do is you can have a lunchtime, lunchtime brown bag lunch. You can show a very short film. These students showed a 10-minute film called The Exchange, and then they handed around a petition of basically at this point in time there was a ban on federal funding for syringe exchange. They passed around a petition that some students could sign uh, asking their con member of Congress to lift the ban on federal funding. And it's a very low threshold way of just getting people to dip a toe in the water and becoming more politically involved. So they did that one week, then the following week they showed other films and instead of just asking people to sign a petition, they did, they did a call and they showed people how to call their members of Congress and right then and there people called their members of Congress. This later inspired these students here to actually go on the Hill and lobby and meet with their members of Congress and here they actually got to meet with the Senator. I realize that not everyone is based in Washington, D.C., so if you're not in Washington, D.C., there are plenty of other options. One option is to call me or call your local, um, your AMSA Educational Advocacy Fellow, and what we can do is actually set up an appointment on your behalf. What we can do is contact your member of Congress and say, listen, I've got a group of constituents who would like to talk to you about this particular issue. We'd like to talk to you about fully funding PEPFAR. I'd like to arrange a conference call and that way you get to speak to the D.C. office directly. If you can't do that, then you can go ahead and meet with the local office. The local office is not as great to meet with, uh, just because the person who's going to be advising the member of Congress is someone in the D.C. office. And so, yes, there is communication between the D.C. office and the local office, but the quality of the communication can vary. So the person the local office may say, yeah, I met with five medical students and they support PEPFAR, and that may be the only message that the D.C. office hears. So if you get to communicate directly with the D.C. office, you control the content, you control the narrative. If that's not available, go ahead and meet with a local office, but then follow up with the D.C. office and say, listen, I met with your local office and this is what we talked about. And that's important for two reasons. One is that it tells the D.C. office that you're highly organized and two, it still allows you to drive the narrative. Um, and then you can always do an ask. Uh, part of it may be come, like we, we run a local uh, syringe exchange, come on down and visit. And I've actually done that. I met with members of Congress and I said, please come down and visit the local syringe exchange. And they've done it. They've come down during recess, gotten tested, had their photo op, <laughs> got to see the syringe exchange in person. So you can always ask them for funding. You can also ask them to come and personally see what's going on so they understand the value of supporting the Affordable Care Act, for example. It's also a nice photo opportunity for them. So there are a lot of different apps that you can, you can request, and we can talk about that another time. But one thing you should always do is write a thank you note, because when you meet with someone, they, they may not remember everything you say, and you may not remember to say everything you want to. So writing a thank you note shows, firstly, that you're well organized, and secondly, it gives you another bite at the apple in terms of defining the narrative. And in addition to writing a thank you note, you could also do something called an organizational sign-on. This was an organizational sign-on that was in support of lifting the ban on federal funding for syringe exchange. It was one letter, so instead of having a bunch of individuals writing individual letters, this is one letter that was signed on by several organizations, including the American Medical Student Association of New England and a number of different organizations. So this is another way that you can reach out to members of Congress. Do these, these things work? Yeah, absolutely. There's actually a formula. Like for every phone call, that represents five constituents. For every email, it represents this many constituents. For every letter, it represents like 15 constituents. If you actually have a meeting, that's considered your, your single person 
meeting with that person, meeting with a member of Congress, you're considered representative of 25 of your constituents. So it's actually a formula that they use. Um, so your voice, it's understood that your voice represents many, and if you do an organizational sign-on like this, uh, it, they understand that you are speaking half of, on behalf of many, many more. And here are some students who are lobbying on other issues as well, like the Repeal HIV Discrimination Act, which is a very important act, which will be coming up again this year. And ways to get involved. So if you want to show a short film on syringe exchange, this is where you go. We talked a little about having film screening, posting things on Facebook, send a tweet, share on listservs. If you can post about the, the dinner you had last night, you can post about Syringe Exchange or you can post about PEPFAR. Also, work with your local Syringe Exchange program. Volunteer, donate, ask them to come speak to your group about Syringe Exchange and who they are and what they do. If you don't know if there's Syringe Exchange in your program, this is the website to go to. And then more options for taking action. You can call Congress as an individual or as a group event. So you can call by yourself like once a day, 8 p.m., 8, 8 in the morning. This is what I'm going to call. I'm going to call once a day every day. Is, um, this is my morning routine, like brushing my teeth. You could also do as part of a brown bag lunch. One really effective way I saw is you get a group of people and you don't hang up. You pass it from one person to the other. So you've got one staffer who's talked to four different people in one single phone call, that's very memorable to them. You can write an op-ed, a blog post, organizational sign-on. Um, you can also write a letter individually or an organizational sign as I just showed you. You can also visit. Not sure how, well, we've got the Georgetown Medical AIDS Advocacy Network and we have a Facebook page and we post on opportunities uh, we've had we, on how to get involved, how to write a letter to the editor, how to write an op-ed. Uh, we actually have a Take Action Tuesday every Tuesday, and some of these are very low threshold things like please send a tweet to Senator Schumer to take the leadership on providing foreign aid because we want to support PEPFAR. The tweet is a very low threshold way to get involved. Uh, please send an email to your member of Congress in support of the Affordable Care Act. That's a very low threshold. Some of these are like please make a call. This is whom you call. This is the script you use. It's sort of just add water kind of advocacy, and it's, it's designed for folks who have never done it before. So all I have to do is sign up. And so if you want to be a member of the Good Doctors Club, this is what you can do. Um, lead by example, practice what you preach, get tested yourself. If you haven't been tested for HIV, get tested for HIV. Cherry condoms, keep naloxone on hand. Go, when you do become prescriber, prescribe naloxone, excuse me, prescribe suboxone and buprenorphine, prescribe Narcan. But you know what, if you get trained now, you can save a life before you ever get your degree. And I'm open for questions. Thank you all very much. Hey, Mary, can you hear me? Yeah. I to oh, yes, I can. <laughs> hey, hey, there we go. We got people unmuted. Um, so thanks for doing this presentation. It was incredible. I've got one question for you. Yeah. Um, so you talked a little bit earlier in the presentation about the differences in um, provisions for providers and how many patients they can treat with a buprenorphine waiver. Um, can you yeah. talk a little bit about the differences between um, regular providers and the number of treatment or the number of patients that they can treat versus board certified addiction medicine specialists and the number that they can treat? Um, to my knowledge, there actually is no difference. So, and I think that's one of the, the um, very, I think one, one of the most frustrating things that I've seen is the, the, the mythology that you have to be a psychiatrist or you have to be board certified in addiction medicine to prescribe buprenorphine. And the answer is no, you don't. In fact, most of the people I know who prescribe it are actually family practice physicians. So my question, and maybe it actually may vary by state, but in the state of Tennessee where I train, there actually is a difference where if you're a general physician in any other specialty, with your buprenorphine waiver, you can care for, you know, 100 patients or whatever the number is. And if you have, if you're board certified in addiction medicine, that number is actually increased. But I don't know if that was different by state or if that's federally mandated, but, or if you knew anything about that. 
I don't know anything about that um, because what the law I just said is actually <laughs> like federal law. And so uh, last few years we've actually had a bill called the TREAT Act. And the purpose of the TREAT Act was to allow non-physician prescribers to prescribe buprenorphine, so like nurse practitioners, um, and then also to eliminate, to actually modify those limitations. So instead of having 30 your first year, you could do 100, and then after, um, uh, after that, there's no limit after your first year. So you could treat as many people as you want. Um, that's something that's come up historically, and I hope it will come up again. It's one of those nice bills that costs nothing but can save lives. So I don't know. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to look into that and get back to you. I'm sorry. Okay, that would actually be really helpful information because obviously, like that's a problem. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And actually, what's interesting is in Washington D.C. So using my city as an example, what was really a, a game changer uh, was when Howard University required all of its psychiatry residents to become certified in prescribing buprenorphine. And again, they weren't certified in addiction medicine, but just making sure that, that was a requirement that they had to get that waiver. We went from having a waiting list from six to nine months to like no waiting list at all. Any other questions? But a friend of mine is like the head of addiction medicine for Kentucky, and, and I'll ask her. She's a family practice physician. I'll, I'll ask her, and I'll find about out in a couple of days, and I'll get back to you about that. Thank you. Sure. Hey, Mary Beth. Um, it's Avanti. I wanted to ask you a quick question. Um, you <laughs> hey, mentioned how are you? earlier. <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Good. Uh, thanks again for. Um, we're willing to give your time to kind of post this presentation for students. Um, you said one great idea that that ANSA could kind of join in on would be to host um, like uh, like treatment sessions on on how to administer administer naloxone. Um, how could students do something like that? Like how, how do they get trained on that to even host that kind of session? I love that question. Okay, so the first half of the presentation is a PowerPoint, and that gives you all the information that you need, and then I will send you two links to training videos. So basically what you do is you do a few slides of the PowerPoint, and then in the middle of the PowerPoint it says show video number one, and then you show video number one, and then you do a few more slides, and you show video number two. And I will actually provide um, contacts for folks so that the – you can actually get the auto injector version of naloxone for free. Uh, you can oh, actually wow. get, you can go, I know. So you can go online, anyone can go online and get one for free, but if you want to order them in bulk because you were doing a training, I can also provide you with that connection as well. Oh, and for folks cool. who aren't so, familiar with naloxone, Oh, for those who aren't familiar with naloxone, there are four different ways of administering it. Uh, one is through injection. The other is through a nasal spray, which is uh, composed of many different parts. The other is a new nasal spray, which is much easier but a bit more expensive. And the third way is through an auto-injector that actually talks you through it, much like an EpiPen would. And so for students that want to host this at their um, chapters, it's basically, I guess, the only thing that you would have to budget out for is if you wanted to give lunch or something. Exactly. For those services. Oh, perfect. Even better. <laughs> Mary, do you have all of that sort of written into a document or a project in a box, if you will? I love that question because the answer is yes. <laughs> Yes, and actually at the national convention, I, I do the present, I do that very same training, and nice. I and so people come, they see the presentation, and they get their powerpoints, and they get the links that I just mentioned as well, and I will send that. I'm happy to send that to you guys as as well, uh, and you guys can share with those who participate in this conference call. Yeah, I knew you already did setting you talk about exciting things at this point. <laughs> um. Evansi, we can it, we can be sure that we have a how to uh, host a naloxone training session as like a project in a box as like a link on some of our AMSA web pages. So we can certainly put oh, that on perfect. AAN. We can put that on yeah. the AAN web page. We could also put it on the community and public health page and the medical education page. 
great. Yeah, we'll get on it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And there are a lot of different target audiences. So you, not just your fellow medical students, but you can also train um, resident assistants. You can do the training for college students. I just did a training uh, for high school students. And it was interesting because this is a mini med school, and I was told that these were very privileged uh, high school students who are a little, little sheltered and maybe not terribly experienced with life and very privileged. And I asked them, how many of you know someone who overdosed? And every single one of them raised their hand. So this is an issue that's affecting all kinds of people. Um, there's a program in Kentucky that actually trains kids as young as age 12 on how to administer naloxone because they're so anxious about making it available as, as available as it possibly can. And for young people who have a family member uh, who is experiencing substance use disorder, being able to do something is incredibly reassuring and empowering for them.